All right. So my name is Grace Gard and I'm the Aquatic Ecology Education Specialist with the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. And um, I'm part of a project where we're really working on developing some wetland outreach and education materials. And we knew that May is American Wetlands Month and we really wanted to find a way to kind of celebrate that and um, give people opportunities to learn more about Nebraska's awesome unique wetlands that we have here. And um, so we're doing that through several different types of presentations about different topics. So um, today we have Becca Yates from Roe Audubon Sanctuary with us, and um, I'm going to let her introduce herself more. Um, but that's just kind of why we're doing this and, and to tell you more about that. So um, I'm probably going to let her take over from here. And then if you guys have questions along the way, um, please feel free to put them in the chat. We probably won't um, ask them verbally. And um, I'll either try to help answer it or we'll ask Becca as she goes through her presentation. So, thanks. Alrighty, let me get my screen going for you guys. <clears throat> All right. Uh, well, like Grace said, my name is Becca Yates. I am the education manager out here at Audubon's Row Sanctuary right in the middle of Nebraska. Um, I don't know if any of you guys have been out here or have heard about us, but we're well known for the sandhill crane migration. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how the cranes kind of play a role in wetlands and the conservation work we do here at Row. Um, I've worked here at Row since uh, February, 2017. So I've been here for just over four years now. Um, so I've seen kind of a wide range of different crane seasons. Uh, last year, obviously COVID hit and we closed early. This year, we still had COVID restrictions. In 2019, we had floods around here, so the road was washed out. Uh, so it's been kind of a unique experience out here the last couple of years. So hopefully next year we get to some semblance of normal again. Um, so if you are not familiar with where Roe is, we are located in kind of the middle of the Central Platte River Valley in this big bend region right here. You can kind of see there's like a bend in the river called the, we call it the Big Bend, um, right along the very critical reach of the river where the sandhill cranes stop over during their spring migration. So we here at Roe have over 3,000 acres of protected habitat along the river. Um, and then the rest of the land kind of surrounding us is mostly fertile farm ground and everything like that. So it's not, it hasn't, uh, been left alone. It's very cultivated now, so it's not um, uncult uncultivated anymore. So it is very critical that we are here to do some conservation work um, as well along the river. So Rose Sanctuary was started in 1974 by the National Audubon Society. Uh, Lillian Annette Rowe actually gave the society money to start a bird sanctuary wherever they deemed was the most critical. So they kind of looked at what habitat was critical in, in, in need of conservation work and they chose right here along the Platte River. So we, we started it with just one small land purchase and over the years we've purchased more and more land to get up to our 3,000 acres we now currently have. And our mission here at Roe is to protect the birds and their habitat now and into the future as well. We want to make sure that this great migration that we are seeing now is there for our kids and their kids and generations to come. We want them to be able to really experience the, the great phenomenon that we're able to experience as well. Um, so one reason why the Platte River is so critical is it we're right in the middle of a flyway. So a flyway is a path that many birds take while migrating. So we are part of the central flyway which as the name suggests means it is in the center part of the United States. So you can see we've got birds coming from down south, Texas, New Mexico, Mexico area. They're all converging kind of in the middle of this like hourglass shape um, along the Platte River. And then they're gonna kind of spread out towards their breeding grounds. So we do see over 240 different bird species using this flyway. Obviously the, the two big ones for us are the sandhill cranes because uh, over 1 million sandhill cranes come through this, this flyway here, but also it's the main migratory population of the endangered whooping crane. So those are another 
big species of bird that we do conservation work for because there's so many of them coming through here as well in the spring. But on top of that, we see lots of waterfowl and shorebirds and lots of grassland birds um, whose habitat is probably the most critically threatened. Grasslands are the most rapidly declining habitat in the United States. So all of, all of our work here uh, benefits all of these different species. Um, like I said, the two big ones for us are the two species of cranes. Um, so obviously the sandhill crane is the big draw. You know, lots of people come to see them. So lots of birds equals lots of visitors for us. The sandhill crane is the, the species of crane with the largest population in the world. So they have the, the most numbers of any crane. And the whooping crane is, has the smallest population of any crane in the world. So they have the least amount of numbers. Uh, so this photograph is kind of indicative of that. You can see all the lovely gray sandhill cranes. And then down at the bottom, you'll see a white blob. That's a whooping crane. So this really kind of shows the contrast between the most species of cranes and the least species of crane. Um, like I said, springtime is our busiest time just because that's when the birds are here. That's also when the people come too. So during about six weeks or so of what we call crane season out here, we see um, normally about 25,000 people coming to our center to see the cranes and to learn about them. So it's a very big reach that we have because people come from all over the United States and all over the world as well. We've had visitors from over 50 countries every year come and visit us during crane season. Uh, obviously the last couple of years, we haven't quite seen that in-person reach just because of COVID restrictions, but fingers crossed um, in the near future, we can get back to, to seeing that many people coming out here to witness this beautiful natural migration that we see. Um, so like I said, the sandhill cranes are staging here. So that means each crane is going to stay about three to four weeks, building up some extra body fat to help them finish their migration. And 80% of all sandhill cranes are in the population that migrates through Nebraska. So if you look at this map, um, they are the mid-continent population of sandhill cranes. So 80% of them are in that population. So you can see they're wintering down in Texas, New Mexico, Mexico area. They're going to stop in that little gray circle of Nebraska for about three to four weeks. And then they're going to spread out over Canada, Alaska, and Siberia once they leave here. So they still have a ways to go once they leave here. And they're really going to spread out. Um, you can see there's other populations of cranes as well with the different colors on the map. Those are just smaller populations, but you can see sandhill crane pretty much in most states, uh, depending on the time of year. So they're, they're not unique to Nebraska by any means. We're just unique because we have the largest numbers of them at any one time, but it's only during the spring migration, which is pretty cool. Um, in addition, like I said, the, the whooping cranes that are still endangered do migrate through here. Um, so you can see that migration line goes from Port Aransas in Texas up through the middle of the United States up to Wood Buffalo Park in Canada where they breed. There's about 500, maybe a little bit more whooping cranes in this one population. So while they do pass through here, they're not staging here like the sandhill cranes. So they're gonna stop for like a day or two and then they're gonna keep going on north. So we don't see quite as many of them and we don't see them for long, but you can still see them here and they still rely on our wetlands here uh, for a food resource while they do stop here. There are about a little under 200 whooping cranes in that Eastern population that migrates up to Wisconsin. And then there's another almost 200 still in captivity. So um, we're just around 800 or so total whooping cranes. So they're still critically endangered, but they are making a comeback slowly, but surely. And some people might wonder, how do you tell two cranes apart? They're here at the same time. They're both cranes. Surely they look the same. Uh, they actually don't look the same. They are quite different. So the, the whooping crane is the white bird. They, you can see they are at least a foot taller than the tallest sandhill crane. So they tower over them by quite a bit. And they've got those nice bright white feathers with black feathers just on their wingtips. You can see that as well. Whereas the sandhill crane are mostly gray with the red on top of their head, things like that. So they really do look very, very different from each other, 
but it's still cool to see them and see how similar they are in other ways. Um, so kind of here's a photograph to kind of get you a sense of what it's like here on the river. Um, at any given time, you know, here at Roe, we'll have maybe up to 100,000 birds on, the, on our stretch of the river. There might be five to 600,000 in about 75 miles of the river. So it's a lot of birds in one area and it can be very, very loud. If anyone's ever heard a crane, you know, that they're, they're a very vocal bird and they can be very, very loud. Uh, but it's a great time here. I always miss the cranes once they leave. The last cranes usually leave about uh, mid to late April. So we had a couple late cranes. I saw some on May 1st, which I think is the latest I've ever seen cranes. Uh, but for the most part, they, they're usually gone before then. So I definitely do miss them once they're gone. Uh, so obviously a lot of the habitat work we do does focus on the cranes. And we do have different types of habitat here at Rose Sanctuary. So obviously we have our braided shallow river. Uh, we have wet meadows and other types of prairie and grasslands. Then we've got some wetlands and backwater sloughs. In addition, we've got riparian woodlands and agricultural land as well. So I'm gonna kind of go through those first three types of habitat on this list, kind of one by one. Um, and we're not gonna really talk about the woodlands and the agricultural lands. They just don't really have much to do with what we're talking about today. But before I move into our first habitat type, I wanna take a pause for any questions that we had coming through. Yeah, the main one was just, um, what is the time frame of the spring migration? Great question. So the first like group of cranes, we typically see around Valentine's Day. So usually not too many are here in February, but the first groups will start kind of coming those last couple weeks of February. More and more groups will come through March and we usually see a peak in the migration where we have the largest numbers on the river right around St. Patrick's Day. Can be a little before, can be a little after that, just somewhere right around the middle of March. And then slowly some groups are gonna to start to leave as March kind of winds down and we head into April. And usually the last groups are gone by tax day. So that's how we usually tell people just as a general time frame. Uh, they can shift a little bit. We've had cranes showing up like by February 1st. So that sometimes happens. And we, like I said, I had I saw cranes on May 1st, which is the latest I've ever seen them. So it's not a hard and fast uh, guideline. That's just generally when we start seeing them is Valentine's Day and then peak at St. Patrick's Day and they're gone by tax day. That's perfect. That's a good way to remember it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, those were, that was the main question for now, so. Okay, great, fantastic. So like I said, we're gonna kind of focus on those first three habitats. So like I said, we're gonna talk about the river channel. Um, obviously this is a lot of our focus for conservation work. Uh, just because it is a lot of our land here, but also it is a big focus point for the cranes. So one reason it needs a lot of conservation work is because it has changed drastically over the last hundred or so years. Uh, so historically, the Platte River would have looked like this back when like the European settlers were making their way out west. This is the Platte River they would have come across. They used to say it was a mile wide and an inch deep which is actually fairly accurate when you take a good look at it. This is due to the fact that the Platte River would flood every spring because there'd be these big snow melts out west in the mountains that would just flood the Platte River Valley with water and also sediment. And all that extra water and sediment would actually choke any tree saplings or shrubs that were trying to grow along the river and in the middle of the river, which helped keep it this wide, shallow section of river. So historically, this is what cranes would have seen when they came to the Platte River Valley to stage. They need a shallow body of water because they actually roost in the river at night. And that helps protect them from predators because they don't have great night vision. So the water acts as like an alarm system for them. So that way, if a predator is gonna come out in the middle of the night, they're gonna hear splashing on the water. So they know that they need to be prepared that there might be danger coming. So that's what they're used to and that's what they're looking for. Uh, you compare this to what a lot of the Platte River currently looks like. A lot of it looks more like this. So you can see it looks a lot different. There's lots of vegetation and trees growing along the river. And this is due to the fact that 
a lot of the river has now been dammed further upstream. So now we control the flooding. So we're not allowing all the extra water and sediment to, to flush the river channel of the trees and the vegetation trying to grow. Uh, we also divert a lot of the water for irrigation and land development. Um, about 70% of the water that would have made it to our section of the river no longer makes it here. So that's a lot of the water that historically would have been scouring the river is not coming down here now. So you can see the water here is being choked by the trees forming these narrow channels and the narrow channels also make it deeper. And so the, the cranes can't roost in that river anymore. It's too narrow, it's too deep, it's just not good for them in order to roost in it. So on our uh, stretch of river here, we do conservation work to try to make our section of the river as wide and shallow as we can. Obviously, it's not going to be to the extent that it used to be, but we can uh, sure do uh, our best to, to help it. So with that, we do tree clearing. So we find areas that are very heavily wooded or have too many trees right against the river and we clear those out or we thin them out at least. So there is um, more possibility for the river to widen in that area, but it also lessens the likelihood of something like a bald eagle to be perching in a tree right by the river and that might spook the cranes. Because even though bald eagles can't predate upon a healthy crane, they can predate upon a sick or injured one. So sometimes cranes get spooked by eagles, especially if they're uh, sitting in trees really close by. So they're not gonna land in the river where there might be um, eagles hiding as well. So we do try to clear some trees. Um, this can be an expensive process. It can cost us five to $800 per acre to do some tree clearing as well. Um, and like I said, oftentimes we're just kind of thinning the trees a little bit. A lot of times we can't get rid of every single tree. There is um, some worry of bank destabilization. You know, there are buildings and houses and stuff along the river that we want to make sure that the erosion of the river doesn't go too far to uh, ruin those buildings. So it is very strategic in the trees that we do take out, but we do thin them quite a bit. Um, in addition, we also manually clear off the sandbars in our channel of the river. So you can see we've got some machinery that'll go through during low water times and clear off any vegetation, shrubs, things like that growing on those sandbars. Um, so this also allows the river to stay wide and shallow because if you allow plants to take root, it's gonna form an island in the middle of your river. And that's obviously not ideal when you want it just wide open and shallow, kind of like the picture there on the right, kind of shows you the goal of the river, kind of wide open, shallow. I mean, every once in a while there's gonna be vegetation on a sandbar, can't be helped, can't clear everything all the time, but the goal is to, to eliminate that as best as possible. Um, this picture, you can really see why it's called a braided river. You can kind of see it looks like a, a braid with the way the, the river is flowing around those sandbars. The sandbars are important for many different reasons. For the cranes, that is what they're looking for when they're coming in to roost. Um, so here is actually some drone footage of the river kind of in the early springtime. So this is what the cranes are gonna see on the river. You can see some sandbars are exposed, but there are lots of them that are just underneath the water there. And that's what the cranes are gonna look for. They'll stand in about three to six, six inches of water to help keep them protected from predators. Um, so that's what they're looking for when they come in to roost at night. Um, so even though there's about 75 miles of river that the cranes will utilize during their staging time, they're not staging in every single part of that river just because a lot of it is not suitable uh, for the cranes. Uh, like I said, we'll usually have about 100,000 on our five miles of river on any given night during normal times of the crane season. Obviously at the beginning or towards the end when there's only you know 20,000 cranes left, we won't have that many. Um, but during most times we'll have about 100,000, which is about a quarter to a third of all of them in the river valley are hanging out on our five miles. And that's due to the conservation work we do on the river to make it suitable for them to roost in at night. So this is what that kind of looks at looks like uh, 
during migration. So you can see uh, they're kind of clumped on where those sandbars would be underneath the water. You can tell where the water is going to be deeper just because there's no cranes standing there. So this is what that kind of drone footage would look like with cranes on it. <laughs> Here's some lovely video. I don't. You guys hear the cranes? Yes, yes. Fantastic. I had to throw in a little video for you guys. <laughs> so while we do this conservation work, mostly for cranes, just because, like I said, they are the draw. They get people here. They get people excited about our work. Uh, they bring donors in, all of that kind of stuff. Conservation often has an umbrella effect. So you protect a habitat for one species, often other species can find protection under that umbrella. Uh, so these are two other bird species that often uh, benefit from those uh, river conservation efforts that we do. So the one on the left is the inter interior least turn and the one on the right is the piping clover. Uh, these guys are little shorebirds that historically would have nested in the very open sandy sandbars that were in the middle of the river during the summertime. Uh, they don't like vegetation on the sandbar, things like that. Um, that way they can make sure that there's no predators hiding in the vegetation, things like that. So once the river got narrower and there weren't as many sandbars or there were trees or vegetation on the sandbars, they had to find other places to lay their nest. So sometimes they're doing it in like gravel mining pits or gravel parking lots, things like that. So uh, obviously we want to do some work and stuff like that to give them a more safe place to lay their nest and keep their babies safe uh, during the summertime as well. So they are another species that do benefit from the clearing of the sandbars that we do here, um, which is pretty cool. Um, a lot of this river work is in cooperation with other organizations, um, especially the Platte River Recovery and Impl Implementation Program, or PRIP as we always call it. Um, they do a lot of work with us. They have been doing work with the terns and the plovers as well, and they would actually give them nesting sites um, away from active uh, mining sites and things like that as well. They also work together with um, government and water rights and things like that to have target flows for the river at any given time during the year. So you can actually go to their web, uh, website and look at their water plans and see how much water flow uh, they, they want the river to be having at any given time during the year, which is pretty cool as well. So we do work very heavily with lots of partner organizations uh, for a lot of this work too. All right, before we move on to our wet meadows, were there any questions about the river? Um, there actually was a question. I know you mentioned uh, bald eagles, but about what other predators would mm. um, attack a sandhill crane? Sure, so the, the biggest land predator that they're concerned about are coyotes. So coyotes are the main reason they roost in the river because they are a land predator. So they would splash in the water if they ever try to come out in the middle of the night to get a crane. Um, so that's the biggest one. Um, even, even then, coyotes don't typically get that many cranes, if any, in any given year. Um, during like their breeding times, when they're up in Canada and Alaska, it's more of a concern for the younglings, the little chicks, because uh, they are ground nesters. So they're very vulnerable to predators. So anything that would eat a little chick, you know, coyote, fox, you know, raccoons and possums would eat the eggs, snakes, all sorts of things are a concern for the, for the younglings. But a full grown adult, adult, it's usually just coyotes. And then if they're sick or injured, bald eagles. Perfect, I think that was it. Okay, cool. All right, so we're gonna move into the next habitat, which are our wet meadows and prairies as well. Um, wet meadows are a really cool habitat. They're pretty unique. Um, and they actually make up a lot of the acreage here at Rose Sanctuary. Um, unfortunately, less than 10% of wet meadows remain in the Platte River Valley that used to be here. Uh, but this habitat is very important. 
as a foraging habitat for many migrating birds, including sandhill cranes and whooping cranes. It's also a critical area for uh, breeding birds during the summer as well. So they are a, um, a big focus of some of our other work as well beyond the river itself. Um, they, these are uh, grasslands that do have, um, that are very close to the groundwater. So there's often low lying parts of the grassland that does have sitting water in it that might rise and fall depending on the, the level of the groundwater at any given time. And so the, the, the soil itself is actually pretty wet most of the time. So while it is a grassland, it's not like a tall grass prairie that we usually think of when we hear prairie, just because those plants are not able to grow quite as tall with that much uh, groundwater right underneath. Um, so a lot of the wet meadows were actually drained and converted into crop ground, um, you know, decades ago. ago. Uh, wet meadows used to line the Platte River Valley, but now a lot of it is crop ground. Um, you might see sandhill cranes in the cornfields, and that's because they will eat waste grain and stuff in the fields. So they have adapted to find food in the cornfields. A lot of their um, caloric intake in any given day is actually waste corn. So they are able to benefit a little bit from that. But however, the cornfields are missing some other food resources that they actually need because cranes are omnivores. So they can't really sustain themselves on just grains. They do need other, um, other food resources as well in order to properly build up their fat reserves and things like that. Um, so a lot of their day, even though we do see them in the cornfields, a lot of their day is actually spent in wet meadows. So it's also a good socialization area. So they're going to you know, take a bath. They're going to maybe court a new mate in the, in the wet meadows. They're going to forage for food because there are lots of good things like snails and invertebrates and things like that in the wet meadows that they can't find in the cornfield. And those invertebrates and things give them some extra nutrition and um, calcium and proteins and things like that that they actually need for reproduction once they leave here. Um, so it's still very critical for them to have some wet meadows to forage in. So that way they, they have all of the correct nutrients that they need once they do leave here and head on north. Um, so, like I said, the wet meadows are unfortunately very scarce just because they're very fertile ground and have been converted into cropland. Um, inadvertently, there's also been lots of water being pulled from wet meadows because of um, irrigation and things like that. So, indirectly, these have also been drained a little bit because of uh, agricultural as well. So, it's not just the direct conversion of the wet meadows into, into crop ground but also the draining of the groundwater has also limited some of these wet meadow areas as well. So obviously here at Roe, we are working at converting some areas back into wet meadows. Obviously this benefits cranes, but like I said, other birds utilize it, um, including grassland birds use it for breeding. Um, and with that, it's not as simple as just like throwing some seed out and hoping for the best. We actually have to kind of change the topography again. So uh, a wet meadow usually has higher spots and lower spots, and the low spots are where the water comes up. So we will actually go through and manually make that kind of topography again, make some higher spots and lower spots. So it has the same feel of the, the untouched wet meadows that we have as well. And then in addition, we do reseed it with uh, native plants, and we usually harvest most of our seeds here at Roe. And we will have a mix of 250 or more different plants that we actually put into our seed mix that then we put out when we are reseeding these areas as well. So you want a good diverse mix of plants because they all have different resources that are gonna help different birds and bugs and things like that. But also it, um, it just creates a, a better ecosystem overall because you wanna make sure that um, pretty much everything can find its own little niche within the habitat as well. Um, and with all of these native plants, we also try to mimic um, those cycles they would have gone through naturally. 
So for instance, we do controlled fires on these, on these wet or grasslands. A lot of these grassland plants actually require a burn cycle in order to germinate correctly. So the seeds just won't grow unless a fire has gone through the area. But fires also get rid of any old vegetation or if one plant has kind of taken over an area and that allows new plants to grow and create a more diverse habitat as well. So the Great Plains actually naturally burned, you know, decades and centuries ago. It'd get dry, there'd be a lightning strike, and then there'd be a grassland fire. So a lot of those plants adapted to those regularly occurring fires. So we do mimic that by doing controlled fires. We do rotate, um, so we're not burning all of it every year, and that would be really hard for us to burn that many acres in one year but also it allows each area to grow for a couple of years before we burn it again as well. Um, in addition, we also, in a lot of these wet meadows, we actually do uh, cattle grazing. So this helps mimic the bison herds that would have moved across the Great Plains as well. So, you know, the cattle move through the area, they turn up the soil with their hooves, they eat the plants down to the ground, all of those things that the bison would have done as well. So this kind of mimics that part of the, the life cycle of the plants as well. So we kind of want to do that as best as we can. All right, before we move on to uh, wetlands and river sloughs, was there any questions about the wet meadows? Nothing in the chat, so I think you're good. All right. So this is gonna be our last little section. And then at the end, I will take any other questions as well. Okay, so uh, wetlands and river sloughs, this is the one that probably has the least to do with cranes, but they're still pretty critical to the work here we do at Roe. Um, so these are more stagnant bodies of water that are usually right along the edge of the river. Usually they're not connected to the river, but during high water times, they can connect to the river itself. Um, for us, the wetlands actually have a big education component to them. So we are actually able to safely get kids into the water so they get wet and dirty and really get to explore what's living in the water, um, which is a really good way for them to make a personal connection to nature. Because, you know, a, they have found through studies that kids who have like a personal experience in nature are much more likely to care about conservation when they get older. So we're trying to create, you know, conservation leaders of tomorrow by just getting them wet and dirty in the water. Oh no. What? So sorry, the phone's ringing. Um, it's all good. Okay, sorry. Um, wetlands are also an important place for many animals for raising their young. So they're kind of like a little nursery. Uh, lots of insects actually start their lives out inside wetlands. So things like dragonflies, which we always see flying around a wetland, they actually lay their eggs in the water. And for the first few months of a dragonfly's life, it lives in the water, finding things like mosquito larva to eat and all that kind of stuff. And then once it gets big enough, it'll crawl out onto um, a plant and it'll pop out as a dragonfly. So there's lots of insects just like that that actually start out their lives in a wetland, but also things like amphibians um, and fish obviously are very reliant on these wetland nurseries as well. So it's a very important part of life of the life cycle for many of our wildlife here in Nebraska. So it's really important for the overall ecosystem to have a nice healthy wetland as well. Um, lots of our migrating waterfowl will also use these wetland areas as well. Um, so it's pretty cool to see, you never know what you're going to find out there at the wetland. Um, so part of our, our education, we actually um, created a wetland right off the river. So this is kind of the planning stages of that wetland and then they dug out the, um, the wetland as well. So this is actually the, the groundwater. So they just had a dig to you found the groundwater basically. Um, and the water will rise and, and lower depending on if it's a wet year or a dry year. Um, but it's pretty cool. And then here's an aerial shot of that wetland that they created. So you can see the river is right there to the to the left of the, the picture. And here's the wetland here kind of zigzagging its way. Um, for the most part, it, it, it's not connected to the river, but it has been known to connect during like a flood year. Like in 2019, it was connected uh, to the river. But it's pretty cool. It's a very, very cool uh, wetland. And it's got a lot of diversity in there, which is really, really cool to see. 
So here's kind of like a nice peaceful moment out there. Um, you never, like I said, you never know what you're gonna see. You might just hear the wind or you could hear some birds. It's a nice quiet time out there, which is kind of nice too. Um, we also seeded the vegetation along the side with um, a lot of our native plants and stuff as well. Um, just so that way we could do our best to keep it a, a natural habitat surrounding the wetland as well. Alrighty, so like I said, even though a lot of our work is obviously crane focused, um, we are here year round, you know, we have staff working year round. So we, we also focus on other parts of the, of the sanctuary and the habitats here and yeah, it's pretty cool to come on out here. You never know what you're going to see. Like I said, every day is different out here on the river. So I'm going to go ahead and take questions at this time. All right. One question we had was, where do you get all the funding for so much work? Mm, it's a great question. So um, we are 100% funded through the center. So a lot of the, the money we do receive is um, like, donations, usually from large donors, area uh, businesses, grants, things like that, give us a lot of our money. Um, but even just, you know, people walking through the door and dropping in money into our donation jar, people buying stuff from our gift shop, people who pay to come see the cranes or do a program with us, all of that helps us out. But for the most part, we do a lot of grants and get funded that way. And then also big donors as well. Awesome. Yeah, do you guys have an admission price to visit or? We do not. Donation? Nope, we just have a, a little donation box. So we just ask if you feel so inclined to drop a donation there, we come to visit, but we don't have an admission to the building at all. Awesome, okay. Um, we had a question of, do cranes mate for life? They do mate for life, yes. So um, a lot of times if we do see courting behaviors, it's often either a youngster that just reached sexual maturity or it's someone who lost their mate because they will find a new mate if their previous mate passed away. Okay, that's interesting. Um, do you do any type of rehab for cranes or any other waterfowl? We don't do any sort of rehab here. Um, our director has told me that in the past they have tried to do, not here, but they have tried to take cranes to rehab facilities, but it's very, very tricky um, to A, even catch the crane, even if it's injured. They're, they've got those really long necks that they can whip around and get you. They've got really strong, tough beaks that they can bite you with. They got really long uh, nails on their toes that they can scratch you with. And if they can fly even a little bit, they're impossible because they're just gonna fly every time you get close to them. Um, and, then, and then even if you do catch it, the survival rate once they're in captivity is very, very low because they get very stressed out and things like that. So the odds of them even living once you do capture them is also very low. Um, so for the most part, if we see a sick or injured one, we just kind of let nature take its course. Either it's gonna get better and migrate or a coyote or an eagle is gonna, gonna get it. And unfortunately, it's just kind of the fact of life. Yeah, that's an interesting question too, just cause I know we have so many wildlife rehab places throughout mm -hmm. kind of Nebraska. So that's a good question. I I would have mm -hmm. wondered that too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So cranes are, are not very good for that, but I know we've we've get, taken calls for ducks and stuff before and we've passed those on to other rehab facilities. We just don't have the facilities for any sort of rehabbing here. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, Jody asked, are sandhill cranes endangered? Sandhill cranes are not endangered. Um, their numbers are steady. They might even be um, increasing slightly. Um, but overall, they're, they're very, very steady. And in a lot of states that they are found, because we only have them in the spring migration, but they're found a lot of their other areas. But most other states, they actually do have a hunting season for them. Now, it's usually you can only take like one, maybe two, depending on the state you live in. So it's not a very high take, but they are hunted in a lot of other states. Yeah, they're pretty popular in Florida, right? There's a good population there and mm -hmm. places. Awesome. Yeah, and I know like Texas and Oklahoma, I believe have hunting seasons for them. Um, I can't remember where else, but a lot of other states have hunting seasons. Mm. 
I, I was on a vacation and was on the um, Snake River, I think that's which mm-hmm. river it was, in Montana, and mm-hmm. saw um, cranes flying through there. And it was like such a big deal because you can only see them in, in a certain place, you know, in Nebraska. Sure. So. sure. That was cool. um, <laughs> we have one other question. Do both lesser and greater sandhill cranes move through Nebraska? They do. Um, so I didn't really talk about the different subspecies, but the, the two main subspecies are greater and lesser sandhill cranes. And we do see both of them through Nebraska. However, the graders tend to be more in the eastern part of the Platte River Valley. So they're over towards Grand Island and the west- lessers are more in the western part. So they're closer to Kearney. So we have mostly lessers here at Rowe. Um, we do see some graders um, and they also do interbreed. So you can have intermediate sized cranes. Uh, so it is kind of interesting. They're not separate species or anything, but there is a little bit of a trend in where they are here in Nebraska. Yeah, someone just added, is it the size that makes them different generally? Yeah, it's mostly just size. So lessers are about three feet tall and graders are about four feet tall. Um, there's a little bit other small changes like their beaks are slightly different, things like that, but it's mostly just their height that makes them different. Awesome. Well, I'll, there's no more in the chat. I'll give you guys maybe a minute (laughs) if anybody (laughs) has any last minute questions, Rebecca, but thank you so much. That was a really fantastic presentation and um, glad I I learned a lot of new things too about (laughs) cranes in Nebraska. So yeah, well, thanks so much for having me. I did put my email there on the screen. So if you want to take down my email, it's just my first name, period, my last name at Audubon. Um, You could always send me an an email if you've come up with a question after we end this program as well. So don't be shy. Feel free to shoot me an email. Yeah, that's perfect. And um, I will probably tomorrow or Monday um, send out just like a a, a kind of like a feedback email. Um, Mm -hmm. So we have a survey and then I love to include any resources that you mention in this presentation. So I'll make sure we talk and figure out what all we want to have in there and links to anything cool. and then all of you guys should be able to get a hold of anybody so sounds yeah. great awesome thank you so much becca for helping me and doing this presentation i appreciate it yeah and thanks so much uh, for having me yeah thanks everyone else i'm gonna go ahead and end the meeting so thank you